Today is Wednesday, January 18th, 2012. All right, we're going to, we, we started talking about pig racing, and I, I think we're nearing the end of pig racing. Right. Tell right. me uh, a little bit more about, about the pig racing. Well, we got off on to last spring when I went and helped Mel Ray, my son, and Culpepper Merriweather Circus here. Uh, but I had to call my ex-husband and my son to put me in gear on where I should actually be. And really, uh, those pig races that we were, I've talked about already, we didn't do them maybe for a year or something. They're still foggy in there. But, um... Then what we did was, and I'm not sure which came first. Let's see, it would have been 91, 92, 90. So, yeah, it had to be, we wound up in southern Indiana, my ex-husband's. It's still hard to get that ex in there. <laughs> but uh, his home in southern Indiana, and we decided to do Christmas shows, which are, indoor shows and you have a Santa Claus but it's the same thing it's still a circus and so I went out and booked it and uh, matter of fact that's the time I'd said before in there about when I had pneumonia so bad and our sponsor wasn't gonna let me leave but uh, we did it we had I think we showed three weeks with that on the Christmas show and that would have been like 88 or 89 ish <laughs> and then we went back to Florida and um, my aunt Torchy let's see how was it I can't remember who passed oh her aunt passed away and left her quite a sum of money and she wanted to take a circus out and I talked, I begged, I pleaded, don't do this, we don't have the right people, we, it's not, no, please don't do this. Fought her every step of the way. I said, go buy you a motor home, tour the circuses, because she was older, you know, and, and, nope, I want you to run it, I want you to take it out, I want you to do it, and I'm like, but uh, it may not work, then what have you got nothing? She said, well, I didn't have nothing before, so what makes the difference? Well, anyway, it wound up. She says, either you take it out or I'll get somebody that will. So, well, that meant whoever would just take her money, and that was it, not even try. So we did, and we put another circus together, <laughs> and we called it Fisher Brothers because that's what she wanted. And she said mostly she wanted to do it because Uncle Cal always wanted his own circus, and this was be like in memory of him. Well, we took it out, but it did not do well. But we made it through and whatever. Where would you book the... Uh, we started out in Florida, and uh, we booked it myself and my sister-in-law, Myrna. Mm -hmm. And my brother-in-law helped some on the booking, Joe. And uh, we toured up through Florida, working our way to Indiana, per se, up into Michigan, because that was kind of always our territory, per se. There's anybody's territory, but that's where we usually had shown. And uh, I'm thinking maybe we got as far as northern Indiana, I want to say, and it just we just were not, it wasn't clicking. Of course, my dad was not there, the mainstay on the booking agent. We didn't have key people like we'd had in the past. And that's what it takes. you got to have the right people with their hearts in it and pushing every step of the way. And don't misunderstand me because the people we had were all for it and did everything we could. But it just was not clicking. So then we wound up in southern Indiana. And I booked the Christmas show again uh, with the same, pretty much the same sponsors, a few new ones. And I got the biggest kick out of the one fella 
because I don't, you don't talk to these sponsors a whole lot. I mean, you know, you do an initial and you do the show and then that's it. And I called and I just said, hello, and how are you doing or something like that? And he said, well, BK, how are you? Or he, maybe, no, he didn't say that either. It was something to the effect, well, how in the world are you? He says, I'm so glad to hear from you. And I'm thinking, I says, you don't even know who this is. He says, yeah, I do. It's BK. And I thought, <laughs> how do they remember me? <laughs> yeah. So I've always had a, I can't never do any bad because people remember me, you know. <laughs> I learned that a long time ago. <laughs> All right, so then we did that Christmas show, and let's see, that is when, when that was over, is when I left Melvin, what I call the real divorce, because I'd gotten a divorce, we'd been married 13 years, I actually got a divorce, and we were back together for 13 years. And then I just, I, I, I'd lost it. I, and I think a lot of it was because I felt I'd let Aunt Torchy down and the people that was working and Melvin was being a jag as normal. Uh, <laughs> he won't say that. He was Mr. Perfect, but he is good. I won't, I can't, you know, but... And that's when my son told me that him and Unity were getting married. And I left and I came out to Texas to Johnny Frazier was doing phone rooms. And so I took a job with him. So what's a phone room? Oh, okay. <laughs> that's uh, what they call telemarketing. And it's like you get these calls of an evening to sell you something. Well, the phone rooms is where the circus calls businesses during the day and tries to sell them, we call them books of tickets. And it'll either be five tickets, ten tickets, twenty tickets, whatever. And you try and sell those to, um, you know, a business. And then they can keep the children. And it's just children's tickets is what you're selling. They can keep them or uh, they can donate them back to the organization or sponsoring organization and they will distribute them to less fortunate children, um, that type of thing. And then the sponsor gets a percentage, the show gets a percentage, and the telemarketer gets a percentage of that money. And then they also do a night sale, which is calling families at home, which I don't know of anybody doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's basically the gist of it. And it helps all the way around because not only, um, and I don't know if I said that in the bill posting aspect, even if you go into a store and ask to put a poster up and they say no, you have still advertised. So this way you have called all the businesses. They have know about it. And in the night sales, you called most of the homes. So now you've told those people on a one-to-one -one basis. So to me, it's really super good advertising. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how long were you doing phone, phone rooms with Johnny? Um, boy, it wasn't very long. Mm -hmm. Thinking maybe a couple of months because that went defunct. <laughs> we have a lot of that in our business, but we get up and try again. <laughs> That's the main thing. And then from there, it seems, and my son says, we went back to pig races, and Bobby Green and I took a unit out. And I think Melvin and Myrna had a unit out at that time. And uh, that was my first experience of announcing. I had never truly announced anything before. But Bobby Green wasn't about to do it, so I had to give all the jargon and the carrying on with the pig races. 
How'd that go for you? That was good. And, and <laughs> the pig races were fun, whether it was with Melvin or with like doing it on my own there with Bobby. Uh, they were fun, but they were boring, as I said before, because you just don't have time. If you, you know, you want to wander around the midway and see what's going on at the fair, and it's crowded, and you can't get back to do those pig races, then you're in trouble. So we didn't get to do a lot of that. We could venture off a little bit, but not, you know, too far. Um, and the funniest part was Bobby stayed home in a southern Indiana, and Jackie Bradford went with me a couple of, three spots, but the first one we went from southern Indiana to Rapid City, South Dakota, and it was when the bikers were having their 50th reunion out there. Mm -hmm. And boy, I'm telling you, all you saw was bikes. There was no, I don't think there was a car on the road except us. <laughs> it was bikes, bikes, and more bikes. And they come to the pig races, and they had a blast. But it was pretty neat. We did get to go down after the fair was over. We went down that night and all through Rapid City. I mean, it was just neat because it was just full of bikers. And and if I recall right, they said there wasn't hardly any problems that year. So it was pretty neat. I was pretty proud. And then uh, we had a few days to make the jump to wherever we were going. So I told them. Uh, uh, well, I just said her name, Jackie, that uh, we need to go see some sights. And we went one day for a few hours, because you can't leave the pigs, you know, very long. And uh, we had a ball, but she made it funny because we're driving and she's reading a book. I said, you're supposed to be looking at sights. We're, in, you know, and she says, what am I looking at? Bunch of rocks over there, bunch of trees over there. <laughs> but we just had fun. So it wasn't often, even on the circus, um, we've been all over the country, but to actually go see the Grand Canyon or to go to Yellowstone Park, it's very rare that you get to do that, especially if you're right on the circus. Now, like where my dad was booking or bill posting when I was young, I was fortunate because we did have time some days to go and do those things. Um, and I'm very proud of Kelly Miller Circus because they make time to take the kids when they're in certain parts of the area to see more than just, oh, there's the Grand Canyon going by as you're trucking by it or whatever site, you know, so it's pretty cool. All right, so Bobby and I did that. Now, Mel Ray thinks I did it two years, but I think I only did it one year. And then I wound up back here in Hugo, and I went to work uh, at the Kelly Miller office, working in the office at Kelly Miller Circus, um, when it was over here in the apartment buildings. And what would you do for them? I kind of run the office. I didn't, I felt like I didn't do much of anything. I just kind of twiddled my thumbs. I was kind of lost because it was booked and it was this and it was that. And, and uh, of course, then David was the manager, co-owner. And uh, I remember there was a couple of towns that, needed to be filled in. I said, David, don't you want to fill it? No, because I got somebody going. But David, I could fill them in. It was like I needed something to do, per se. But I just made sure the girls did what they were supposed to. I did payroll and just kind of run the office, per se, like type thing. One whole lot of nothing. But it was a job. And I had my granddaughter here. She was in first grade because... Maybe Mallory and Unity were on the show that year on Kelly Miller. So I kept her when school started. And that was in 2001 because that's when the Twin Towers. I know that year. Um, 
Then after that, I think I went back to Florida for, yes, I did. Went back to Florida for a while. Don't ask me what I did there because I don't really remember. Let's see. Was that the year maybe Bobby and I worked for Ward Hall? Sideshow. That could have been right in there. And uh, we did... Um, was it Miami? It seemed like it was Miami. Palm Springs? No, that's California. One of those bigger towns down in southern Florida anyway. And that was a experience of a lifetime. And I love Ward and Chris. And we had more fun. About killed us, but we had more fun. <laughs> because their other acts didn't show up. So Bobby and I and Ben Dwayne was there. He was the announcer and a uh, magician per se. And uh, so Bobby and I'd just take turns. I'd be the headless woman. And then Bobby would be the snake man. And then I'd be... Spider Woman, and, and then Bobby would be whatever is next, and then I'd be the electric lady, and and one time Ben was not paying attention, he couldn't hear for nothing, and somehow the thing wasn't set right, and I was getting shocked, and I kept screaming, and he's just announcing, finally he turned around, and I'm trying to stay from getting electric. Cute, and we did. We just had a ball, and it was cold, rainy, and I put up side wall around, and and they all laughed because I'd make some kind of big old pot of stew, and we'd all gather. And little Petey would come, and he'd eat, and Ward comes. Now, did Pete give you two dollars for his lunch? I said, Ward, I don't care if he did. Not. <laughs> well, he needs to pay you something, <laughs> but it was just. Fun. I mean, we, we were dead. So then we went back, we finished that, went back to Gibsonton. And it had to be in February because the fair, the Florida State Fair was going on. And uh, the trade show was going on. And Bobby and I was over at the club. And I says, well, I'm going home or whatever for a while. And Bobby says, well, I'll sit here. And as I walked out, here come Ward, just a trucking. And I'm like, i got to avoid him somehow. And uh, BK, BK, our acts didn't show up again. Can you and Bobby go <laughs> do the fair? Like, oh, my God, Ward. And so back in it. I said, Bobby, come on, we got to go. Where are we going? I said, well, Ward needs us. No, I'm not going. I, yeah, you are. Come on. So we did the fair then, the Tampa State Fair, to help him out. But the axe came a couple days later, so I'm like that there. Gibsonton uh, is an interesting town. Oh, yes, yes. Very interesting. It is. Way, way old, old, old with show people. There are a lot more carnivals there than there are circuses, but as a matter of fact, I don't know if right now if there's any circus that actually winters there. But the carnival people are there. And it has the... Uh, uh, Independent Showman's Club. International Independent Showman's Club, and it's huge, huge. They just, they do a lot for things, and every year they do a free circus. Well, it's not a free circus. The public has to pay a nominal fee, but the acts donate their time. I mean, they might buy your gas to get there or something like that, but... Uh, they donate their time, and it's usually a pretty nice circus because you have all the Highline acts. <laughs> and, uh, oh, we just, they have all kinds of things. Like this extravaganza uh, is where all the buildings are full of merchandise of what the showman needs to buy, like the vendors will come, uh, the insurance companies will come. They set up brand new rides out in the back to try and sell and 
It's pretty neat. Uh, it's like a trade show, I guess, really. They call it that, too. And um, then they have a welcome home barbecue every year with huge people coming in. And, and it's great because you just you can visit. You see people you haven't seen for a while. And so it's, it's really a nice club. And this club that I started here, I tried to go by the guidelines pretty much that they had, uh, with ideas of what they did, but we're still young. <laughs> and, uh, but I said, I told him not long ago at our club, I said, that club started, I think, in the 30s with maybe eight people. So, you know, it's taken them a long time to build where they are today, and so... I mean, they have a lot more carnival people. They have, you know, and there was more circus people there. So it had a little more where there's just not as many of us here. So. Okay. Kelly Miller. Then I went back and we did that with Ward. Oh, and then I went to Atlanta, Georgia for Pat Guthrie. Well, Ray and Pat Guthrie on their carnival. Well, he did, he started a... I think he called it the Atlanta Fair. And it was big. I mean, it was a huge thing. And um, so I did that, helped him. What did I do there? Relieved tickets, sold tickets, just kind of whatever. And then I stayed on with their carnival. Yep. Peach tree rides. <sighs> Boy, I'm telling you, this is getting old. This for the birds. <laughs> um, I was there five years. Wow. And I did the. They call it um, grab joint, or we call it a candy wagon. There's another name that the carnivals call it too. But it's candy wagon to me. It's I sold the cotton candy, candy apples, caramel corn, the popcorn, sodas, snow cones, that type of thing. And argued with Pat most of the time. Mostly my job truly was, and my son was there, and another fella, Roy, they were like the superintendents over the rides. So every teardown night, it was my job to get Pat off the lot because they'd get a ride coming down and Pat would go take one of the guys and put them over here and, and just have them all mixed up. And Roy and Mel Ray would say one of them would come. Don't you and Pat need to go to the Waffle House and have coffee? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I'd get him to go <laughs> most of the time, not always. <laughs> and then when we get back, the show would be down. <laughs> But if he stayed, we were there all night. <laughs> and uh, uh, we've been back and forth with Pat. Now, there's another thing, too, because after we did the circus thing with Jimmy and Marlon and all of us down in Texas, which I think I talked about before, um, we didn't know Pat. Um but Jimmy knew him through Hoxie Tucker, who owned Hoxie Brothers Circus. And Pat was going to take out a circus because he's kind of a circusy fan, like, although he's carnival. Um, and they've had for years. They were young. I mean, they just had the carnival forever. And um, what was that? I can't remember. Anyway, we. Melvin said, all right, we'll bring our show over. Because Jimmy then was going to work for Hoxie Brothers. And it kind of broke up our little indoor show down in Texas. And uh, so Melvin, they hired me to book. Okay, I can tell you when it was. It was 1981. Because in 1980... We had the concessions on Hoxie Brothers Circus. 
So in 81 is when we were doing that little indoor show with his brother, Jimmy. So then we, just, we agreed to go with Pat on his circus, brand new type thing. And I think he'd been out a few weeks the year before, and I agreed to book. So I went on ahead. And when I got there, I had a meeting with Pat. And then here was this young man, and I'll never remember his name. I should, but I don't, and probably never will. Um, who had been on Hoxie Brothers Circus with us the year before. But he had walked in off the street, never been on a circus, never seen a circus before. But Pat had hired him through Hoxie. So my guess is Hoxie is trying to get rid of him <laughs> and stuck him with Pat. And so Pat would say, he showed me the contract. It was one of those stupid, long, blah, 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 blah contracts that I hate. And uh, Pat would say, now, in this case, what would you do? So I'd tell him. And he would turn to this fellow and he'd say, is that right? And the guy would say, yeah or no. And I'm like, hmm, okay. So then Pat would ask me another question, and I'd answer him. And this, is that the way it works to this other guy? And I'm like, uh, he don't know. You know, my mind is saying. And several questions. Well, by the time I left the office, I went straight to a payphone. Somehow got a hold of Melvin, and I said, don't bother coming. I'm headed back. This guy is an idiot. <laughs> and explained, you know, that he's asking some 1st of May if I'm right. <laughs> you know, and of course, Neva Stas a little bit upset. Melvin says, oh, you can't. We're about halfway there. Just stay. We'll get through it. We'll make it. And I'm like, no, please, God, no. But I did, and we made it through that season, and then we went again. Well, there was a little difficulty in booking, because Pat, I used to get a kick, because I'd have to call him every night, and he'd answer, Hey, BK, that's the Georgia way, though. Hey, it's not hi, how are you, or hello, it's hey. And, uh, of course, I wasn't used to it. And uh, I'd say, Pat, you're going to have to send me some help up here. Oh, well, there's this fellow over here that's going to help you. Well, what's his name? Well, you don't need to know that. I said, well, how are we going to coordinate? I'll coordinate. And it just went on, and it was all screwy, and the guy didn't book one town. So now i got to double back and fill in two weeks' worth of things like clockwork. Of course, that's my expertise on booking is fill-in dates. And then, um, oh, and then his wife Pam came up. She did all right for a week. She got me another week ahead. Well, you don't stay ahead when you're booking. It's like the Pac-Man game. He's eating you up. <laughs> so, went on, finally. He says, well, I'm sending this other fella. And I'm like, no, that's all right, Pat. I'll just, I'll do something. I'll work 24 hours. <laughs> But no, I'm sending him, and his name was Almond Brandon, and he came, older gentleman, and uh, made all kinds of sense, got out there, and we just worked together great. So we got it ahead and got it going, and we had a decent season, and uh, thinking we stayed the next year. Can't. Yeah, we started out the next year. And Pat was paying gas, or gas, and then all of a sudden he switched to mileage. And I took him a receipt from the week before. Well, I'm not paying it. And uh, I said, okie dokie. So I went back to the trailer and I told him, I said, he ain't paying it. 
Oh, the hell he ain't. And over Melvin went to the office, and I went over to the concession wagon where Jimmy Kernan, our really, oh, I love him, friend is at, and uh, told him what was going on, and Jimmy says, well, what's, what do you think is going to happen? I said, well, we'll probably be leaving here soon. And <laughs> <laughs> over a $10 gas bill. But we're people of your word, your word, you know, and we just can't help it. So Melvin stepped out of the office and did his head him up and move him out. And I said, well, Jimmy, I'll see you down the road somewhere. <laughs> and so we left. See, and then where did we go from there? I forgot about that. That was before Kelly Miller and all, so it had to be in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so Melray said I went with Guthrie in 93, so that's back when I was there for the five years and did the concessions. And I don't remember why I left. But I came back here to Hugo, <laughs> and um, that is when Barbara and Gary hired me to drive um, DR and Barbara's motorhome on Carson and Barnes, and then uh, Isla took sick, and they didn't go on the road that year, and I wound up. Uh, left my truck and trailer here, and I drove a camper. I stayed in it, and then I pulled the Chinese people's trailer and went with them. And I really didn't have a job. Uh, it was just whenever, if you need, if we need you, you can sell or take tickets, or we can, you can high seat. And you know what that is? Mm -hmm. Oh shoot! I just keep coming up with these names. That's good. Uh, okay, if you have a big crowd, and, you know, when you go to somewhere, you're not going to climb to the highest seat. You're going to go maybe halfway up, or you're going to get where you want to be. So when you have a large crowd, you have to have someone saying, would you folks mind please scoot over, let these people up, and you're picking out seats, finding, and the fuller it gets, we can see that there's an empty seat where you would go and it looks like it's full up. And then we take you and uh, deliver you right to a seat so you have a seat. And that's just called high seating. And uh, if you know it's a big crowd to start with, you will be in there trying to get the people to set on higher bleachers so that the ones aren't climbing over you, you know, to get a seat. And that's called high seating. Well, that never worked out too well. I didn't seem to do much of that. But Gary made me have a radio, a walkie-talkie. And I have to tell this. So, went on a week, and he never called me. You know, and I'd say, Gary, I said, why don't you give this radio to somebody that might need it more than me? No, nope, you have to have it. I might need to call you. And no calls. Gary, this is silly for me to carry this around. You never call me. Then I'm out there. I check if I need to take tickets or where you need me. I'm there. Nope, I might need to call you. And that was the same answer over and over and over. And I tried to get rid of that radio because all it did was sit there. So... One day I was sitting in the camper, and I just got laughing, and Laura Harriet came, and she says, are you all right? And I says, oh, yeah. I says, I just thought of something. And uh, I says, you know, Gary makes me keep this radio in case he has to call me. And I said, I just realized, if I'd have known being a call girl was this easy, I'd have done it a long time ago. <laughs> We don't have that circus job on our list yet. Yeah, I've never had that one yet. <laughs> that one, I'm not sure. I can't explain that one to you. 
<laughs> so then finally one day the purchasing agent left and um, Gary did come and talk to me or sent for me. He didn't even call me then. He sent for me <laughs> and uh, asked if I would take over purchasing until he could get someone. And I said, sure, no problem. He said, yeah, but you know Parker, you know, he's, he's hard to work for and he don't like women. And he was the mechanic on the show. And they live right out here. And I've told this story many times. And, uh, and I knew him and not well, but knew who he was and everything. And Gary says, now you're going to purchase for the mechanic shop. And that's your main one. You're actually part of their crew. He said, I don't care if you don't buy for anybody else. You keep Parker happy. I says, okay. So I bought for the mechanics, the electric, the welding shop, and the big top. So I had to, four people I had to check with every morning to see what they needed. So being the studious person that I am, I took my little clipboard the next morning over to the mechanic shop because that's who I'm supposed to take care of. And Bill was standing out there, Parker, Bill Parker is his name. And I says, um, well, Bill, I said, do you have a list or do you know what you need? Well, goddamn, BK, I ain't even had my burrito yet. Jesus. I said, okay, I'll be back. So I went and made my other rounds, and when I came back, I saw him standing. So I kind of snuck around to the truck, and I saw one of the other mechanics. But I was close enough so Bill could hear me. And I said, um, hey, I said, has Bill had his burrito yet? And he, Bill hollered, yeah, I've had my burrito. Here's your list. So I went and got the list, and I looked at it, and I saw, okay. Went, got what was on the list, brought it back. So the next morning, same scenario. But when I got there, I said, Bill, you had your burrito? Yeah. You know, and it, it just, mm. he, he didn't want anybody to like him, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> so... Um, anyway, that went on first week, and I'd look at this list, and I'd think, I don't think we need that stuff. I know I saw some in the shop truck. I don't know why I'm getting that. But it was always something hard to find. Mm -hmm. So I was being tested, which I knew. But every day, like clockwork, here it was. Here it was. I'd bring it back to him. Well, I finally kind of won him over a smidgen, or at least I thought I had. And uh, so then, oh, it just went on, and Gary hired some guy. Of course, I have to go pick him up at the airport, and he says, now fill him in what his duties are. And I go, okay. Well, this guy is a goof. And... He, he couldn't find his way off the lot, let alone back onto the lot. So I'm like, well, Gary, here he is, but I don't think he's going to last. <laughs> well, you never know, BK. And I'm like, okay. Three days later, he was gone, and I was back to purchase. <laughs> so uh, by this time, Bill realized that I was okay, and I knew about parts. Well, he didn't realize my both my brothers were terrific mechanics and that's all I ever got to do was hand me this this is such and such so I knew parts pretty good well uh, how was it oh so I finally I discovered that uh, every morning he would take one of the mechanics to breakfast so now I've kind of swung Bill around that I'm an all right person okay so this one morning, I says, Bill, I says, you know, you take, I'm part of this mechanic crew, aren't I? Well, yeah. And I said, well, you know, you take one of the guys to breakfast every morning. You haven't taken me to breakfast. Oh, my God. If Gail ever found out I took you to breakfast, oh, she'd have a fit. Because his wife had to stay home with the kids. <laughs> I says, 
I don't think she'd care. Oh my God, no. Oh my God. Oh my God. No. <laughs> so every morning I'd agitate. <laughs> yeah, see, you took so and so to breakfast. Yeah, you know, I'm just nothing. I, you know, <laughs> I'd pick on him every day. And I'm telling this long story because I'm very proud. Uh, Bill Parker paid me the highest compliment I've ever been paid in my lifetime. And uh, so I was getting ready to leave. Gary shot me another stupid thing. And I leaving to go to the, get the camper because I had to take it over to the mechanic shop for him to check everything for the trip because we were in California. And uh, he could see I was like either ready to cry or explode or something. And he said, well, he got you, didn't he? And I said, yep. And uh, he said, well, he said, now you know why I stay to myself. And... Uh, he says, but BK, he says, let me ask you something. I said, all right. He says, would you stay if I bought you breakfast every morning? Now, I'm sorry, but to me, that's the highest compliment I have ever had in my lifetime. Thought that I was pretty proud. <laughs> You know, so that was that story. Well, anyhow, I came back to Hugo. <laughs> so the answer was no? Uh, no, I wasn't staying. <laughs> no, I wasn't staying. <laughs> so I came back to Hugo, and uh, I was parked over here at Tony's with my truck and trailer, and one of the girls come out and said, BK, there's a fellow on the phone for you. I'm like, okay. So I went in and it was uh, Bob Childress, who at that time owned Hendrix Brothers Circus from North Carolina. And I had met him at Pat Guthrie's in Atlanta a couple times, was all, maybe two or three times is all. We visited with Pat and uh, Oh, and I forgot to tell you, Pat thinks that my son is his son. I forgot that part. So we, we were close friends, even though, you know, things happen. And it's just like a family. This whole business is like a family. You're mad at him today, and you're fighting or sticking up for him tomorrow, you know. But anyhow, um, he offered me to come and manage his circus with a decent salary. And I said, okay. So North Carolina, here I went. And uh, got there and, and did it all. Uh, I actually managed the circus and got it all going. And he wanted to go to Wisconsin, and I kept trying to talk him out of it. I said, no, no, no. This year we need to go up the East Coast and come back. Stay close to home. Next year you want to go to Wisconsin, we'll truck that way. But he wouldn't listen. Well, we got to Wisconsin, and business wasn't good. So he closed the show. Okay, from there, my friend Bill Griffith, that I had grew up on his show, that gave me all these jobs that I thought he was being bad about, but wound up being good, teaching me. Uh, I stayed with him for a week or two, and he kept talking about wanting to do a little... He, owned, he had been buying calliopes. We know what that is, right? You might as well tell us. You know them as calliopes. <laughs> Steam uh, music, uh, pianos, organs. <laughs> Why the difference in the pronunciation? I have no clue on that one. We, we just like to be different, I think. It's calliope. It sounds better. Okay. Well, I don't know if it sounds better, calliope, <laughs> but calliope. I honestly don't know that answer. Okay. See, there's something I don't know hey. about this business. <laughs> That's when you say, oh, just look it up. Yeah, look it up. You guys figure that That's part right. out. <laughs> but, you know, I really don't. It, it just always been calliope in the circus. But uh, so I stayed there. 
and he kept wanting to do this little Calliope thing in the parks. Wanted me to book it. Now we get some concessions and sell them. It could be free, like a little entertainment thing in the park. And I'm thinking, Bill, that isn't going to make it. What do you sell? You're not selling. It ain't going to work. And I'm not quite sure how we worked around to a carnival. But we worked around to, oh, yes, I do. Because I said, well, maybe if we had three or four little kitty rides, which would draw the young kids, you know, and then do a little show and they could, you know, the Calliope play and uh, blah, blah, blah. Maybe it would be something, you know. And uh, I can't remember. Anyhow, this one morning he got up and he said, come on, hurry up. We got to go to Baraboo. I said, oh, what are we going to Baraboo for? He said, we got to get a billboard. Of course, we still call them billboards. They're amusement business now. And uh, he says, if we're going to buy a carnival, we got to get finding some rides. Okay. So we went and we bought a carnival. He bought a carnival, but I was partner. And then my son came up and we hired guys and painted rides and fixed rides and bought rides. And uh, I booked it, uh, which... I, it's so funny in our business because the carnivals, they just think it's a horrible, horrible. They just can't hardly book anything where they book anywhere from three days to two weeks in one town, and I'm booking one town one day. And so it was like a snap for me to book the carnival. Now, we didn't have great fairs or great celebrations, but it was our first year. But we pretty well broke even. And then... Did it have a name? Oh, yeah. Mid-America Carnival. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then Bill got tired. He didn't... Well, he didn't come out all the time anyway. Because uh, he's an older gentleman. I mean, you know. And... Um, then uh, we got so we were running out of route, and I kept saying, "Bill, you got to book something. You got to book something." Oh yeah, maybe I will. But his daughter Linda, who were my kids when they were little, that's the ones I babysit for. <coughs> Excuse me. Had said, "Now, BK, when he gets bored, he'll just say forget it," and he did. And so we wound up in. Um, southern Arkansas at some friends. They had property where we could park everything. And then we wound off just wound up just selling it off piece by piece type thing. And then that's pretty much when I came over here to uh, Hugo and pretty well have stayed ever since. And that was either 98 or 99. And then... Oh, I went to Canada with Gopher Show since I've been here. Uh, what did I do up there with him? I think I kind of bill posted and booked and advertising and back on the show and just a little bit of everything. Let's see, what else? Where did I go next? <laughs> you always seem to be somewhere. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's it's a continual. I think well, you and then came I back here though. What was since that? since ninety eight, yeah, it's pretty well or ninety nine. It's right out of that winter, and the reason I say that is because ninety nine is when I had the colon cancer, so I remember that I came before that. But like 2000 is when I started the chemo. So in the fall of 99, but I was here before. So it's either like maybe the winter of 98 or the spring of 99 I came. And um, what else have I been there since then? All right, girls. Um, I'm running out of 
info here. Well, <laughs> oh, I went with Ringling Brothers for Ralph Gifford. Put out coupons and posters. Mostly just drove. The boys wouldn't let me get out and do anything. And I said, I've got to get out and move. I can't just sit in this car. <laughs> you, you've been involved with carnivals and circuses. What are some of the major differences between the two? The, the major difference is, at a carnival, the public entertains themselves, and at a circus, we entertain the public. As far as the workings go, there's a lot of pig iron <laughs> at a carnival. And... They stay for, like I said, three days to two weeks, sometimes 17 days or longer at the fairs. Um, where we move pretty much every day. Uh, nowadays, they do a lot of two-day stands. Some do three days here and there. Um, what do you like better? Oh, the circus. Yeah. Why is that? You have more time to yourself. And it's very strange because carnival people cannot understand how we can move every day and still have more time for ourselves. But on the carnival, you just don't seem because once it opens, you're there. You're either at a ride, you're at a game, you're at a concession, you're whatever you are doing, you are there. And most of them, the latest they open is noon. And a lot of them will open at 10. Some of the big fairs open at 8 o'clock. The first year, and see, here's another one, that we did the State Fair of Texas with our little old snake show. We set up right next to Warden Chris Hall's big side show. And, of course, we're friends of theirs. And I'm the day person. Melvin's the night person. So, of course, I got the day shift. And the fair board sends you around a sheet, and it tells you the hours that they're open each day and the clothes and what's going on and that type of stuff. So the first day, the sheet says we open at 8 a.m. And I'm like, uh... There ain't no idiot going to be out here at 8 o'clock riding these rides. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. Blah, 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 blah. Of course, I had the snake show open at 8 o'clock with my big thermos of coffee. And finally, Chris comes sauntering around. And, well, it was before 8, I was out there. And I said, Chris, you want a cup of coffee? And, yeah. So I said, this is the dumbest thing I ever heard of. At 8 o'clock, open in this carnival. He said, no, because the people will be here. I said, oh, Chris, don't give me that line of garbage and blah, blah. At 8 a.m., the gates open. And at 8.02, you cannot get across that midway. Hmm. It is packed, jammed, crammed with people. Hmm. Uh, now, this is back when they run consecutive 17 days. Now they split it up on weekends or something. but uh, And just packed, just packed. The people would go in our little old snake show, and, and that first day I'll never forget because I kept looking at my watch. says, Melvin, you better get out here. I'm not going to make it. Melvin, you need to get out here. So he shows up at 11 or noon or something, and, I couldn't leave. I got up in the corner. I said, uh, I said to the people, I just kept saying, um, uh, please hurry, please move along. Please let your friends and neighbors come in and see this giant snake. And, you know, and just to try and not push them, you know, that we wanted them to see it, but we wanted them also to, they're lined up everywhere. And uh, they said, at the end of the fair that year, they said, carnivals go by footage. If you have a show or a game, they charge you by how long your tent or how long your thing is. Uh, so 
per foot, our snake show outgrossed that big old side show. Wow. <laughs> we didn't, you know, money wise. Yeah. But, uh, uh, per foot. So we put a lots and lots of people through there. Mm -hmm. And uh, where'd you find your big old snake? Oh, I don't remember where. And then we, I'm sure we had Conga then. I don't remember where we got her from exactly, but she was huge. I mean, she was big. It was a python. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the only thing I'm afraid of in the entire world is any kind of snake. It's live ones, dead ones, big ones, little ones, and phony ones. Only five kinds. <laughs> But guess what animal I got to name? Guess what animal I usually always got to clean? The conga. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky but you. I had her train. Now, people think snakes aren't smart. But if I, I had a stick, nice little soft. On the end, I made it everything nice and nice. And I could tap her just so, or rub her just so. If I wanted her to go to the other end of the cage so I could clean this end. <laughs> or if I wanted her to get in the water and then I touched her just so. But it took a long time. I mean, we worked and I'd try and stop her, you know. I'd, no, get in the water and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but, um, <coughs> <clears throat> I was so lucky. I was so happy. And my brother-in-law, Jimmy, uh, well, the, when we bought Clark and Walters, uh, we had a big snake came with it. Willie was his name. And he was he, bigger than Conge even. And uh, so I, and I, of course, I got to run the snake show so much. You know, I just, one of those, they love me. <laughs> you know, but I would tell people, and I thought I was exaggerating, because I would put my hands together, and I'd say, now that's kind of like their heads. I said, maybe they're a little bit bigger. I said, but they dislocate their jaws, and they swallow their prey whole. And I'm saying, ooh, ooh I'm exaggerating. I'm really telling the big story here. So one night, Jimmy came, and he'd fed the Willie's chickens. We bought him big chickens. <laughs> Willie would eat. And uh, he says, come on, BK, you got to come watch the snake eat. I don't want to see that snake. Get out here. You're going to go with me and watch the snake eat. <laughs> and so I'm glad I did because this was not exaggerating. And they do a thing where it's like, Part of it kind of comes apart, and they'll like hook in, and then it'll come and hook in, and come and hook in. And they, Willie's, was around a chicken like that. Hmm. So this was not exaggerating. <laughs> so I felt better after that. <laughs> a lot of people think they know a lot about animals, but I don't know. There's so many people that don't really listen to the animals. That's what always upsets me. Mm -hmm. they, uh, you, you have to listen to them. They'll, they'll tell you what they want if you pay attention and if you live with them and eat with them and sleep with them. And, like people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. You mentioned pig iron. What is yeah. that? Oh, pig iron is just the iron that the rides are made out of. You know, they're all mostly steel or whatever and they just call it pig iron Curious. yeah yeah that's okay you mentioned um you know as you finish up one opportunity you go to another opportunity mm -hmm. how how do all these people know where to find you well don't let's see um I'm going to get up from here when we leave, and I'm going to walk out that door, and I'm going to trip and sprain my ankle. Within 10 minutes, everybody's going to know about it. Um, it's, I, we don't know. Even the ones that we've done it and we've had it, Melvin, uh, years ago, before cell phones, any of that kind of stuff, we were in Virginia, 
and the bill poster had put posters on the telephone poles, which was illegal there in that county or whatever. So the sheriff came down, wanted to know who the manager was, and his mother said, that's him right over there, and went and put handcuffs on him and took him to jail because we weren't supposed to do that. Well, he didn't do it, and we didn't know that we weren't supposed to at that time, and which had to be in 68, probably, 1968. And um, he was gone maybe an hour when another policeman brought a message Frank something from California was calling, so I went to the phone. I heard Brownie was put in jail, and what can I do to help out? Well, it wasn't Brownie. That was my Melvin's dad. I said, well, it was Melvin. And I said, well, well, I just heard. Now, we were in Virginia. He was in California. And there is a grapevine somehow in our business that does it. But the main one, and he never did tell me how, was when I was telling you that Bob Childress called after I came back and was parked over here and the girls come got me. And I'd only met the man maybe three or four times. Now how he tracked me down, got Tony's number, and I actually asked him, but he wouldn't tell me. He said, I got my ways, so I don't know. But it's well, it's kind of like I've always been the address book for the business. And it's like if you called and says, I'd like to get a hold of so-and-so. I'd say, oh, okay. Blip, blip, blip. Oh, no, I haven't got that. But Joe Blow over here will know where they're at. And so I called Joe blow and he oh no but Susie knows where they're at yeah, okay so I call Susie oh, okay so then I call you back and I so here's the number for him it's kind of I think that's more how that you, they find out you're not working it it's like <clears throat> it's like a gossip column <laughs> And I'm sure... I hate it because I don't like gossip, but... Internet and cell phone, it has oh, to be quick, quicker Oh, Yes, now. yes. Just quicker. Yes, because when Lucy was in the hospital last fall, I'm on Culpepper, just happy as a lark. And nobody come and said, Lucy's in the hospital. I can't even remember how I found out for sure. Everybody on the show knew because they was on Facebook. And I, why didn't you guys tell me? And I'm having conniptions because those kids didn't call me. <laughs> they were threatened with the end of their lives. Didn't do much good because they didn't call me this time either. <laughs> mm. um, well, let, let's back up just a little okay. bit. I want to know what it was like raising Mel Ray. On the circus. Oh, that was easy. That was the easy part? Yeah, because my mom had him and wouldn't give him back. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the truth. Uh -huh. It really is. Because many nights I'd, Mother, could Melray please spend the night with us? Well, maybe. <laughs> but it, it's not hard with kids on the show. It really is. And they're there. And one of the good things. I think it still goes on today because I haven't really been right on the circus proper for the past really 10 years other than Culpepper this past fall for three weeks. But everybody looks out for the kids. Everybody. Everybody. Uh, working men do. Uh, now, years ago, like I told before, working men weren't allowed to talk to a perform anybody. I mean, they better stay to themselves. They maybe could talk to the concessionaires uh, or maybe some of the men on the show, but they better never speak to a woman or a kid, ever, boy or girl. 
nothing, Zippo. <laughs> and, um, but they still watched out for them. I know that sounds crazy. But then they would go get somebody and say, hey, Mel Ray's over here messing up, or he might get hurt, or whatever. Well, then somebody else would go get him and whale his butt. Uh, because we just, it's a family, period. I, I, it's so hard for people to understand, I think. I don't know. Uh, we say you get sawdust in your veins. We really mean it. We say the circus people are family. We mean it. Um, but he went to school, he, and I was fortunate. I got to go to school because I, my mother would take him home for school, and um, then after she passed away, he stayed with his other grandmother for school. Um, I think one year I stayed home with him for school, but... Um, and it's not hard because they just grow up. We sort of grow up as adults, but yet we're still kids. Mm -hmm. We understand. Uh, I remember in the last thing there, uh, you asked, did they tell you you had rules that you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that? And I was thinking about that this morning, and I, I don't honestly remember of uh, them saying, don't do this, don't do that. It was kind of a built-in you just knew uh, from the time you're born. It's if you're, if you're raised on the circus, you know, born and raised on it. It's just uh, nobody else did it, you don't do it. Or if you did it, then they'd say, hey, we don't do that, you know. Or you got your butt whipped. <laughs> I mean, one or the other. <laughs> Was he always interested in learning, um, for example, the whip act? Oh, yeah, too much. Too much? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure is too bad Bobby Green isn't here to answer that one for you. <laughs> he uh, clowned uh -huh. from a little bitty boy. His grandmother took him in all the time to clown. And then I think the next thing pretty much learned to juggle. And that's where Bobby Green came in because the act every day or so or three would get a little longer and a little longer and a little longer because Mel Ray would incorporate new things to juggle. <laughs> you know, just anything that was handy like uh, hammers, regular old hammers. I mean, I don't mean special built because things have to be balanced to juggle. Or should be. It's easier. And, oh my God, what all did he juggle? <laughs> Bobby said, you got to tell him to quit doing that. The, the whole show is his juggling. <laughs> so we kind of had to tone him down a little bit on the balls, the hoops, the clubs. You know? A couple little other things, all right. But, you know, you got to slow it down. <laughs> and... Uh, he never seemed interested in aerial acts, in working anything aerial. Uh, but he did the animals. There's pictures in there with him with the pony, with the baboons and stuff, the goats and animals he liked. Um, uh, he liked... Um, well, his dad was buku into movies. And he was wanting Mel Ray to be in the movies. And Mel Ray was kind of iffy about it. I mean, he, he was all right with it, but he likes the special effects better. So he would build bombs and uh, traps and uh, little different things like that. <laughs> They'd go out in the woods and he'd blow his cousin up. <laughs> his grandmother would die and... We played Evil Knievel with the little motorcycle, jumping the ramps, but she thought that would be a good act, you know, in <laughs> the show. And his, his, his grandmother, Melvin's mother, and I called home. She said, you have to talk to Mel Ray. 
You have to make him stop doing this. I said, well, what is he doing, Mom? Well, he's got these boards so high now that if he falls, he's going to break an arm or a leg. And I said, well, Mom, he's a boy. <laughs> you know, if he does that, then you take him to the hospital and get it fixed. <laughs> he weren't going to stop. You don't stop him now. He, um, Toby Tyler Circus. Oh, there's another one we were on. <laughs> There's been a lot. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's called uh, Russian Swing or Revolving Swing or Revolving Trapeze, they call it. And it's just iron bars like a trapeze, only it's solid. And it's a loop-de-loop. -loop. And this one day, the girl somehow got, as a, they had it too high in the tent. And it got caught in the canvas as it flipped over. And um, Toby Tyler's tent, probably 35 feet at least tall. And there she hung. It wouldn't go back. It wouldn't go forward. She can't get out of it. Uh, she's there. And the web setter, a few other people that was much closer, Nothing. Mel Ray is over there shinning up the rope with a knife to cut her loose. And I'm like, ah, you know, because once it's loose, they're going. Well, he's not strapped in, but she is. I mean, he's fearless like that. Um, another time in winter quarters, they had the poles put up and they were practicing either web or cloud swing, can't remember for sure, the girls were, and he was helping being a web setter, and the rope or something popped, and the poles all went. Well, the girls couldn't do nothing. They just fell with it. What does Mel Ray do? He's got his arms wrapped and trying to hold the poles. Well, that's impossible, and... Uh, he had third degree burns all down his arms, but it's just him. Mm -hmm. He is that way. <laughs> and I've learned to not worry anymore, and I just have to. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I'll say, now, Mel Ray, be careful making that trip. <gasps> Mom, you know I'm never careful. And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> but he's, he loves the business. He he likes carnival business, all right, but I do think he likes the circus better. He seemed so much more at ease last year on Culpepper, but he was kind of lost because there wasn't that much work for him to do. Um, but um, it wasn't hard raising him. I, maybe it wasn't hard raising him because he is an exceptional child. Mm -hmm. He has never given us any problems, nothing, nothing. He was a teenager. His dad would say, Mel Ray, it's 10 o'clock. Don't you want to go to town? Mel Ray, it's 9 o'clock. Why don't you go down and break out some windows in the pool hall? <laughs> Mel Ray, why don't you go do something? Get out of our house. <laughs> so he's just kind of been a homebody and but he, he's excellent at makeup, I mean, and, and at the special effects. And we wish he would have had more of a break, uh, maybe in Hollywood or the movies, because I think he'd have been good at it. Uh, he's been in, and I'm maybe lying, four or five movies. Um, and we had a... a Oh, what are they called? The casting director in Atlanta there. She wanted him to stay the one year. I think he was 16 or 17. And uh, she said if he'd stay with her and her husband that she could get him more roles and stuff and get him pushed more into the business. But where we travel, you know, he can't be back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But nope, he wouldn't stay. And he, we knew her. I mean, he liked her, and they were nice people. And 
and all that, but he wouldn't stay. Hmm. He wouldn't stay. Well, you, you grew up in this business, and what is it about circus life that that's really attracted you through the years? Keeps you so tied to it. My best answer? Love for it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's many things. Uh, when you are performing, especially, when you know that you have made someone happy in that audience, that they have enjoyed something, there's no better reward. Think about it. I mean, even in your life, when you do something for somebody and you know they're truly enjoying, that makes you happy. Um, meeting people. Just so many different people. Uh, you... I don't know how to explain that. It's like me meeting you guys. I think you're great. I mean, I just am in love with you. Not, not you know, in a bad way. But I think you gals are just the greatest. And I have so many people that I have met. I've met a lot of people I didn't care to see again, too. But it's still part of the traveling and the, the aura that's there that you... You get to meet people, and you see so many places. And my husband's barber said it the best one time. He told him, he says, Melvin, I don't think it's fair. He says, you get paid to go see all these places when we have to pay to go see them. I mean, we have to go and travel. Of course, it's like I said, you don't get to see all of them. You maybe as you're driving by, there's the petrified forest. Oh, yeah, that looks good. <laughs> but you saw it, you know, or you've got glimpses of it. Or um, so many times people will say, well, I'm from Kentucky. And I'll say, well, we're about in Kentucky. Ipswich. Oh, yeah, I know where that's at. You know, and no, you don't. I saw, yeah, it's right next to Lebanon or you know, whatever, because we've traveled them all. We've It's exciting, yet it's hard work. Most of the days you're just exhausted. Even when you're young, <laughs> you get wore out after about 18 hours. <laughs> um, the one show we were on, uh, Mid-America, Another one. Another one. That was with Bob Tripp. <laughs> uh, we were up in Kansas or Nebraska where they have those nice little rolling hills for ditches. I mean, they're just little ditches, but they're kind of, they're not a deep ditch. They're just kind of smooth and rolling. And uh, this, he had booked these towns with like two weeks worth. 200, 250, 270 miles every day after day after day. And uh, he had a big motor home, so he would leave early, go about halfway, find a little roadside park or wherever, or a big empty lot that he could pull in, start the generator, make coffee. We'd all pull in once we got there. And he's pouring the coffee to keep us awake. We'd get to the next town and set up, and we was lucky, maybe an hour or two sleep, and do the show and start moving again. And this one night, well, I think it was getting daylight, and we all had CBs back then. And I was driving our Cadillac, pulling our horse trailer. And this guy come on the CB, and he said, BK. And I grabbed the mic and I said, yep, come on, you got her. He says, do you always drive in the ditch? And I'm like, what? And I was down in one of those nice rolling ditches just trucking. <laughs> Don't have a clue how I got there. 
but I sure got out of it quick. <laughs> I was awake the rest of the trip. <laughs> but uh, Marna said today, she says, with Jimmy, he's being so sick now, and she said, but you know, look at all the times and things that Jimmy could have been dead already. And I said, yeah, me too. And Melvin and all of us, you know, but we, we have life-threatening experiences a lot, traveling and doing our line of work. Um, but I told her I haven't figured out because God's been able to take me many, many, many times, many times. He's had me right at those pearly gates. And then he goes down his little list, and he says, okay, who we got today coming in? <laughs> no, not BK, send her back. I'm not ready to put up with her yet. <laughs> but... The most is you just fall in love with it. I, I don't know how you, and you either like it or you don't like it. I mean, it's, uh, or you are there for the money, if there is any, because uh, a lot of times there isn't. Uh, um, but I think most people that really are in the business, stay in the business, or whatever you, you you just love it, it it's uh, my dad it was worse than probably anybody i've known in my lifetime but he, i'm serious when i said he ate breathed sleep drank you name it for circus that was it uh, he, that was all he wanted to talk about that was his life well not really all i mean he did joke and stuff too but uh, the uh, elephant area out here out behind caught on fire this past summer. Well, it wasn't long after it happened, I got a phone call. The elephant barn's on fire. Well, I was one of the first ones there. I mean, it's not my circus. I don't work there anymore. If something happened with Kelly Miller, I'm Jim needed a town book last summer, sometime. BK, I, I needed, oh, in the spring. Oh, in the spring. <clears throat> and I says, uh, he says, would you mind trying to fill it in for me? And I said, no, I don't mind at all. He says, oh, it's the 4th of July. Oh, thanks. <laughs> One of the hardest ones to book, but I got it for him. Um, and they said they turned out pretty good, <laughs> you know, but... Uh, doesn't matter. I, if, if it's circus, if they're having problems, I want to help. And I, most show people are the ones that are really, truly show people. Um, Lucy's brother, Joe Loyal, when you're talking about the difference between a carnival and a circus back a few minutes ago, Joe Loyal was killed in an accident in one of my trucks, or our trucks, however you want to word it. Uh, a carnival was headed to the valley at the same time. I don't think there was three trucks that passed that didn't stop to see if they could help us. And probably the three trucks were working men that knew they weren't supposed to stop for nothing. That's what they've been told. But the owners, they will send trucks back, we'll do whatever you need. I mean, it's show business. It's, yeah stick together. And while we're on this, I want to say why most circuses and carnivals and stuff get a bad name. And years ago it used to be worse. Um, anyway, this is my scenario. Let's put it that way. I pull into town with my circus today. We set up. Uh, some local kid comes down, wants a job, so we hire him because we need the help. Three days from now, uh, instead of him coming and say, hey, I'm a little extra hungry, I'd like to go get a soda or some lunch meat to have at my room or something, he goes down to the local 7-Eleven and steals it. Now he gets caught, the police come, where are you from? Oh, I'm from the circus down here. I'm with the circus. 
He's only been there three days. He's not really with the circus. So a lot of times I think that that's, people say, oh, they come in and rob you. We did a show <clears throat> years ago. We drove from the Rio Grande Valley to Gainesville, Texas, because our friend lived there. And the governor from Texas was coming to give a speech at the Senior Citizens Center, and they wanted to do a show for him to appreciate that him coming and talking to the senior citizens and blah, blah, blah. And Boots Madden was the guy's name that lived there, and his father and mother, his father played organ, and he'd go and play at the senior citizens so many days a week to entertain them. So this governor came to town. We drove from the Rio Grande Valley 750 miles free to do this show because Boots asked us to. And it was inside a building, and the governor is on the stage, Boots is on that side in the dressing room, and I'm on that side in the dressing room. And the governor's going to do his speech, and then we're going to, he's going to sit down, we're going to do a show for him. And the governor starts out almost right off the bat with, um, well, if I'm elected, I'm going to clean up the streets and I'm going to get the police more involved and whatever and blah, blah, blah. And that way we're going to make it safe. So when the carnival comes to town, you don't have to worry about locking your doors. Now, you see, I went a little livid. Boots went a little livid. His dad's holding him back and Melvin's holding me back. He said carnival. He said, I said, I don't care. He don't know the difference between a carnival and a circus. I drove 700 miles to do a show for this idiot that's accusing me of being a thief. <laughs> Boots is doing the same thing on the other side. I'm not doing that show for him. Boots, we were mad. Well, they calmed us down and we did the show. And the Maddens got an apology from the fella. But that's, it, it, it. they just think that. We're the true show people. Oh, you got some that'll try and rip you off or whatever, but they do it. To me, you ought to be smart enough to figure it out that they're conning you. <laughs> or something, I don't know. But they're really, most of them are pretty honest uh, show people, carnival and circus, I think. There's some, few, but they're the ones that give the everybody else a bad name. The public perception. Right, mm -hmm. thank you, yeah. So you think y'all get a bad rap sometimes? Uh-huh. Even today? Yeah, it seems to be not as bad nowadays. People seem to be more liking circus, trusting circus, more interested in circus as they were years ago. Um, Bill Posting as a young girl, uh, teenager, maybe 12, 13, so years old, um, you go in and ask to put a poster up in a five and ten cent store and I don't want that stuff in my building. That circus comes to town and takes all the money out of town. And, of course, first time that happened, I didn't think too well. But the next time or so that it happened, I said, well, wait a minute. I said, we buy our food here. We buy our gas here. We do our advertising here. Now, I would like to know where did you buy this box of Kleenex from that you're selling? Oh, it says New York City. Now, who takes the money out of town? And walked out the door. <laughs> so the, the perception is bad. They don't, some people just totally don't understand. Um, 
I've been in stores where they're actually marking up the prices because we're in town. And admitted to it, even. <laughs> Are there, there cities that you feel more welcomed in as a showman? No. No. Um, we have some sponsors that seem to be, they'll welcome us more than others. Uh, but as far as the city in general, and there are differences in the cities, even during the performances, you can tell uh, by their reaction to your acts. I mean, if they're really applauding and, and really happy and having a good time overall, the entire show, you know that they like it. Whereas uh, there's sometimes they're just kind of in between clapping or what, which leads me to another story. On Mid-America Circus, Bob Tripp had some of the best acts in this country. And I do mean top of the line names. We were in Kansas <laughs> again. I don't remember what town. And for some reason, he had me doing swing and ladder. It's a nothing act. Nothing. It's, well, I mean, I'm going up against uh, Franz Bruin and big names, you know, here. And I told him, I said, I don't want to do swing and ladder. These people are great. You know, swing and ladder is up. It's what you learn when you're a kid. It's just a fill-in act type thing. Well, anyhow, this one day, whatever town we was in, here's all these big name acts, beautiful, wonderful, exceptional acts. There's no applause. There's no applause. I don't care what act went in. The people didn't applaud. And so they just, you know, leave the ring, come out. And I had my robe on, of course, and I went, because Melvin was doing the announcing. And I said, Melvin, what, they didn't applaud. What are they, what's, he said, they ain't been applauding. They haven't applauded one act yet. I said, well, by God, they'll applaud me. No, BK, don't do that. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> so in I went, went with my time, my widow puny ass swinging ladder <laughs> through the whole thing no applause nothing came down walked to the front of the ring as I always did and styled nothing I walked to the right styled nothing I walked to the left I styled nothing I walked to the back styled nothing walked to the other side Walk back to the center of the ring, styled. Walk to the front of the ring, styled. And I know Melvin was back there going to kill me. <laughs> and finally, he said, well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe she's leaving until you applaud. And they just busted out applauding. And they applauded after every act after that. I don't know if they didn't know they were supposed to, not so, but I'd never in my life came across that. I mean, two or three people will at least that much, you know, or something. But it was nothing. But I'd made up my mind, I ain't leaving until somebody applies. <laughs> For the lousiest act they saw that day. <laughs> but darn it, they were going to applaud. That's right. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> well, after Melvin told them to. I can see that. What do you think is the hardest job on the circus? <laughs> if you had to narrow it down. <clears throat> what's the hardest mm. job and what's the most important job? They don't have to be the same thing. Okay. Most important is booking. I mean, that's an easy one. Without a town book, you ain't got a circus. You don't need the rest of it. <laughs> you got to have some place to show. So to me, that's the most important. Um, hardest. Well, booking is up there in the top ranks on that. <laughs> hardest. 
It's all hard. It's all hard. <laughs> it ain't much easier. About it. And then on the other hand, it's all easy. Right. It's just you got to do it. Um, well, I've never been asked that question before. Booking is one of the harder jobs, and it's the most important. How did uh, how did you become? Now, do you mean hard as to doing it, or physically hard too? Because both. Well, mentally hard is booking. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you're stressed on making sure there's a town for that show to go to. Um, physically. Really putting a big top up and down uh, would be physically. Uh, you have a lot of acts that are physically hard to do, but they only last a few minutes using your muscle. But the big top, it's quite a while, It's and especially if you don't have any help. <laughs> and especially when it was canvas versus the vinyl. There One's different? just about as hard as the other to me. Um, uh, I like the canvas better. Um, it breathes. Uh, the vinyl doesn't breathe. I don't know how to put it different. The vinyl, uh, to unfold it, it's stiff and it's hard. It's most of it's as heavy as the canvas was. Um, if you had a really good canvas tent, it was probably a little heavier, but it's not really any lighter much weight-wise overall. Um, Through the years, you'd have to put up your fair share, help put up your fair share of tents? I put them up. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Drove stakes with sledgehammers. That was what killed me at Culpepper last spring. I couldn't even lift a sledgehammer. And I wanted to drive the first stake. <laughs> Just because I figured it may not get to ever again. And all I had was those stupid 20 and 22 pound sledgehammers. Nobody had a 12 pounder <laughs> even. I might have swung that one. I can swing a stake or a sledgehammer and drive stakes right along with the best of them. Triple up on them. Because I know you've seen the old movies where three or four guys are pounding one stake and I can do it. Well, it's a lighter weight sledgehammer now. <laughs> I used to do it with a 16 pound. I don't think I ever used much anything heavier than that. Yes, ma'am. I drove 38 stakes for our sideshow almost every day for a long, long time. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. That's why I hurt so bad today. <laughs> Well, what would happen if you if you were to get injured? Would you? Well, you wait and see whether you're going to make it or not, and then you might go to the hospital. <laughs> or if you just hurt really, really, really bad, you'd go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I've had pieces of iron steak in here, and I've had monkey bites over here, and <laughs> rope burns everywhere, <laughs> and... Uh, clonks in the heads. One time I had a knot that my hand like that fit over on my head. And, uh, see, I'm different than a lot of show people, and especially women show people. The majority of the women were performers or concessionaires or office people and cooks, but I don't know. I guess I'm half tomboy, but I never felt like I was. Um, Not afraid to get your hands dirty. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, carried seat boards day after day, tied the stringers down. I mean, drove stakes, pulled tents up, and <laughs> carried side poles, carried center poles, carried quarter poles. <laughs> Just did it. <laughs> Can you park with the best of them? I can park anything you want, anywhere you want it. <laughs> Does it matter how big or small the space? Nope, nope. <laughs> and if you was hanging around me very often, every now and then, I still say, 
Well, just get out of the car. I'll get it in there. If you can't get through there, you don't need to be driving. <laughs> oh, yeah. When you drove in the 60s in that Kentucky and West Virginia mountains on the roads they had back then, honey, you can drive anything anywhere. <laughs> My one time <laughs> going up this horrible mountain and Don Gillette was broke down halfway up with his semi. So you got to go around him. Well, I felt the front left tire drop off the ledge and I'm like, Ugh! and then I felt the back end of my trailer hitting the front end of his truck. And I just knew I'd knocked him off the blocks that he was on, but I didn't. Creeped on up, got just at the top, making a left turn, and now the bank is on this side of me, and here comes this double-wide mobile home at me. Well, only one, there's only room for one vehicle, two to barely pass, and I hit the brakes, and they were the air brakes, and when I hit that, I killed the engine, and I'm rolling back over the mountain. The back end of the pole truck was hanging over the back tires was already over the cliff and so i'm telling you that's why god he I, he says oh, oh no no that's bk can't put up with her yet how this fella did it i will never know he stopped that semi with that double wide trailer got out and grabbed some kind of big boulder and threw it under the cab truck the back wheels of the semi tractor part because the other part was already over <laughs> and stopped me from going on over that cliff mm -hmm. close and, calls yeah i was good till he says do you want me to drive it on up the mountain get it out of there and take it on up the mountain and i no no because my husband would kill me if I let somebody else drive this truck. <laughs> so he backed up and got up because at the top, it was right at the top, one nowhere to the top, and it had pullouts. And so he backed up and I got on up there. He stayed with the rock to make sure that, you know, I could get it on out of there. And, uh, got up on the top and I just waited for Melvin. I said, you go down, you get my car, you bring it back up and you drive this thing down. I ain't going down. <laughs> but I did. <laughs> and one day his dad and I were out in Colorado coming down a mountain. And I don't know, I went to step on the brakes and it didn't do nothing. It just went to the floor. <laughs> oh. But I got it stopped and slowed down and <laughs> we made it another time i pulled in on the lot and melvin says bring that truck over here so i can water the elephants and i just kept spinning that steering wheel and going straight so five ten minutes before that if i'd have been out on the highway i'd have been gone um well i can go on <laughs> and on <laughs> So you see why I'm decided, you no, know, God is not ready for me. <laughs> you have more than nine lives. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are there any jobs in the circus that women would typically stay away from? Yeah, putting the tent up. Putting the tent up. <laughs> yeah. Men working animals. Um, we have a lot of women work animals, don't misunderstand me, but they're, they are a special breed, I mean, that want to work the animals, but, uh, putting the tents up, uh. Not too many women mechanics. No, mm -mm, just me. <laughs> well, they used to laugh because I'd be, have the hood up and my butt sticking out of the <laughs> engine. Oh, that's just BK broke down again. She'll be in town and soon. Of course, I had, like I said, two brothers, and I knew a little bit of stuff. They never let me get in there and get dirty. 
And my brother just told me not too awfully long ago, he says, uh, no, because mother would have killed us if you had a speck of dirt on you when I was growing up. Because I always get mad at him. Uh, started up, pumped the clutch, hit the brake. And I, but I want to see what you're doing. Why don't you show me how to do that? You know, what if I'm out on the road somewhere? No, no, just tap the starter, uh, you know, turn the lights on, hit the brakes, pump the clutch, give it a little more gas. That's all I ever got learned. <laughs> but they would tell me mm -hmm. uh, things like how to do them, or if you hear this, that's what's wrong. And so when I'd have to be on the road, I'd be looking, yeah, that's what it looks like that he described, and let's try this. <laughs> But I'm really not a mechanic. I think you like the challenge. Oh, any challenge. Uh, that's probably why you're drawn to booking so much. Yeah. Especially those hard dates. Well, I don't know if that's it or that's the way I started. Because when they threw me out their book and it was on close dates. Mm -hmm. and, and I told that in the first part because now I booked even Carson and Barnes. Well, almost two years here just recently. But most of my, I don't know, maybe a few of the dates I had three or four months out, but that was as far out as I would get. Most of them, I was a month or so, and I, I bet I started doing it that way. And you know how you learn something to crochet one way, you and somebody tries to tell you, you know, hold it like this, it don't work as well. And so I don't know if that's it or, but I'm a good challenge person. Uh, yeah, don't tell me I can't do it. I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> I'll figure it out. My brother bought me a present. I should have brought that and I meant to. It's a box that has these papers right here. They're just little note papers and it has stripes on it. And on the top it says, Impossible, you say. Nothing is impossible when you work for the circus. So I guess that's been my motto all my life. There isn't anything impossible. You just have to work at it a little harder to make it work. <laughs> I want to know about a couple people. All right. Tell me about Ralph. What a pain in the butt. <laughs> well, there is a couple different Ralphs, but I'm assuming you meant Ralph Gifford yep. since he just passed away, and I knew him a little bit. Well, you know I'm his second wife. Oh, didn't even break a sweat there. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph was a character, and he was a pain in the butt. Ask Susie his wife, she'll tell you. <laughs> he was a worry wart. <laughs> He was a good guy. Uh, he loved the show business. Uh, what other kind of things do you want to know about him? Well, you, well, you all worked together recently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, were, what were you doing with him? Uh, the last I did, I mostly just drove him around and made sure he was all right and took his medicine and argued with him. <laughs> Same thing I usually did. <laughs> And he was out bill posting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he would worry about uh, six months down the road. And he was always going, now, BK, do you think that you can go do Dallas with me? Well, when is it, Ralph? Uh, November. Uh, Ralph, could, let's wait. You know, I may not be alive by then or, you know. But he, he did worry, and he wanted everything right. He tried to make sure everything was right. He, he just loved the business. He, uh, but he's a character. I mean a character now. Uh, and we all loved him, though. I mean, uh, I don't know what to tell you about him. He's a good guy. He... Uh, Ralph really loved the business. Tell me a little bit about the first time you met D.R. Miller. Oh, hell, I don't remember. I was a little kid. Oh, I've yeah. known him all my life. <laughs> what, what, 
what you think of him. Oh, he's, he's another character. <laughs> <laughs> DR was a very tough hombre. Um, and somewhere in there, he is a very soft hombre. Uh, very smart. Um, hmm. What else can I say about DR? <gasps> What was his, his in, your, in your view, did you appreciate his approach to circus? Mm, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Back when he was young, he was too tough. I mean, he, he was mean. He, he'd just leave Colcock in and beat you to half to death as to look at you. He had a good reputation for that. But a lot of, in the same time era, a lot of the guys did. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's back when they would roll you up, beat you half to death, and roll you up in the sidewall and carry you to the next town, and then unroll you and make you go to work. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he mellowed. Um, but he, he was tough. He was strict. He, he wanted things right. And uh, in his really heydays, I mean, that show was great. It walked, talked this country, buddy. Outdid them all. <laughs> and we he don't hear it. too much about his wife. Isla. Mm -hmm. It's because she didn't, she wasn't overly involved in the business end of it. Isla pretty much was a lot in charge of wardrobe and the show itself. Maybe she would get into that. Um, but a sweetheart. Everybody loved Isla. She just elegant lady, very down to earth. You were never treated as you were below her. You were her equal. You you just admired her. Um, she never. I never saw her get mad. I mean, and like I say, you weren't around Isla as much. Isla was either in the trailer. Or she took care of Barbara. I mean, she really was a mother mother. I mean, she she did a lot of that. Uh, but DR was the flamboyant out on the lot and raising heck. And if I, we visited, I hated to almost to visit. BK, go tell them to do this. BK, go get this done. I said, DR, I'm just visiting. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Put you to work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's why I never wanted to work for him. He may offered me several times a job. I said, I don't think so. He'd kill me because he knew what I knew how to do. Mm -hmm. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, no, he'd work me to death. And he would have. <laughs> so you, you've been several different places. And we know you came to Hugo at some point, but what, what brought you to Hugo? Like like to stay here, kind of to live here, you mean? Yeah, or? I mean... I have been in and out of Hugo all my life, visiting. Okay. Okay. As long as I can remember, this was the truck. We come through, we stopped, we visited, with, we'd make the rounds to all the show people and visit for two or three days a week, whatever. Uh, or if you had just happened to be hurrying, you visited who you could and got on back to work. Uh, but we lived in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. <coughs> I was born and raised in northern Indiana. Don't like the snow and cold, so I'm not going back there unless it's, I'm really desperate. <laughs> uh, lived in Florida. I do not like Florida. I like it because there was show people there. That's the only good thing I can say about Florida. Uh, so years and years, several years ago, even before Melvin and I was divorced, I said, well, when we retire, First, I was, we're either going to live in Florida or in Hugo, because they're show people. Um, then we actually lived in Florida for a while, and I'm like, guess I'll retire in Hugo. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> they're show people. <laughs> but 
that's what's made me decide to be here. And now it's growing so big, I'm ready to move out in the country. Are you really? <laughs> it's getting too big. <laughs> too much traffic. <laughs> uh, well, when you grow up on a circus, you're on a little old lot with a little old town. That's true. Which is the circus town. <laughs> You just mentioned the R word, retirement. Yeah. Are you retired? Uh, probably not. <laughs> I'd like to be, but I don't think so. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if you can. Can you retire? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think they let you. <laughs> because it's uh, always BK. What are you doing? I need you too. <laughs> I don't want to retire completely. I'm not physically able to. Just go out there and do it like I used to. I mean, I'm, I'm face it, I am getting older. Uh, seems like leaps and bounds, <laughs> but um, you see, what I'd really like to do is just go hang out on a circus and just kind of help out where I can, when I can. But that's not going to happen because when you are on the circus, you need to work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like when I went, told him I'd come cook on Culpepper. Well, I knew I couldn't do it by myself. And Mel Ray was there, and he said, well, Mom, he said, I don't do that much. He said, I'll help you when I need to. Okay, well, that would have been all fine and dandy, except three or four days before I left, I fell and messed up my foot. So it made it harder for me to do it. And they don't have just a certain eating time, so it made it harder yet. And so I was pretty pooped. Well, I was kind of getting in the swing of it by the time the three weeks was up. <laughs> and my foot had quit hurting. And But I was there. I cooked. I told them I'd be there, and I was there. Of course, like I say, I couldn't have done it without my son's help. Hmm. I wrote on that paper to explain to you about the Silver Lake name. That would be great. Why don't we do that? Okay. Um, Silver Lake is not our legal name. It is Timber Lake. But if you go to any show people, they're not going to know that. They're getting so a little bit more, but for years and years, they haven't known it. And way, way back on this, and of course, it's my husband's side, not mine. Uh, <clears throat> it was Timberlake, and they started out, I think, before vaudeville, actually, <laughs> the family generations back. But as vaudeville came into the scene and they started doing more vaudeville, it would be like uh, Melvin's grandfather and great-grandfather were more into the vaudeville type acting, and they told him that uh, Timberlake was just not flashy enough for a show name, you know, it just didn't set well. So they came up with Silver Lake, so that they used as a professional name. Then part of the family broke off, let's see, probably in the 30s, 40s maybe, I'm not sure when Arthur went to California, but Arthur and Florence went to California. Part of the family moved out there and started working, trying to get into the movie business. And um, so it was Arthur Silverlake and Florence Silverlake. And And if I can get it turned off. And um, he got into the movies. And Florence got into the m movies in more bit parts. And that was back when the movie industry out there was all concerned with the communist role, and that Silver Lake sounded a little too Jewish. So they cut it to just Lake then. So Melvin's cousin was 
Arthur Lake, who is Dagwood and Blondie in the movies. So that's how the change in the names, it's all come about. But most people in show business don't know that it's Timberlake. And if I'm doing anything circus related, it automatically writes Silver Lake. And if I'm signing a check, it's Timber Lake. It just automatically works that way. Well, we learned about Timber Lake. Yeah. Do you mind telling me how BK came about? What What does BK stand for? You know, I ain't going to tell you what it stands for. That's going in this, going in the history books. <laughs> but it came about because when I started booking, I was young and beautiful. <laughs> Don't look now. <laughs> uh, and I would stay in motels, and it kind of worried me being a f single woman, you know. And I don't know, I just started writing BK Timberlake or Silver Lake, whichever I felt like using at that time. And uh, that way, if another teller, I say teller, uh, clerk. clerk, yeah came on and it was a man or something, they wouldn't necessarily know whether I was a man or woman because I didn't put Mr. or Mrs., I just put BK. And I just felt a little more safer, but that's actually how it started. And I don't know how it picked up. But it's the same with Melvin, my ex. Uh, he is more known as Colonel Mel now. And that came from we hired an um, Elvis impersonator. Uh, who did our concerts, uh, and the guy just kept calling him Colonel, Colonel, and uh, just, you know, teasing like he was the Colonel, Elvis's, <laughs> Colonel Parker, and uh, it just stuck, so now it's Colonel Mel most of the time. <laughs> but we have all kinds of names for people, I mean, you know, it's just nicknames, what they happen to Turtle, uh, on the pictures you'll see Ken Turtle Benson. Well, he got his nickname because he worked for Carson and Barnes and was in a truck accident and he was in a body cast and would walk around the lot. <laughs> and they, and so they, it just, and it stuck. He's Turtle. <laughs> I'm sure some names are more flattering than others. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you, when you think about the circus, and you attend a circus today, whether mm -hmm. you're working or enjoying the show. What are some of your favorite sights and smells and sounds? Ooh, all of it. The elephants and the cotton candy. Smelling the elephants or seeing the elephants? Smelling them. <laughs> well, describe the smell for me. Well, to me, it's like roses. To you guys, it stinks. <laughs> well, once in a while, it stinks to me, too, but... When you haven't smelt it for a while, it's like, oh, that's great. That's elephants. <laughs> but I love elephants, so, you know, I'm kind of attached. When the first winter with Clark and Walters, we wintered in southern Indiana, and we had to keep them in the barn, the elephants, to keep them warm most of the days, or nights especially. But, you know, you take them out when it warm up some, but... A lot of times, Melvin would not change clothes before we'd go to the grocery store. And like from three aisles over, somebody would holler, Timberlake, is that you? Because <laughs> they could smell him. It wasn't they could see Because <laughs> he'd smell like the elephants. <laughs> uh, and as far as the acts, if they're a good act, I love to watch them. Trapeze, I... Sometimes I'm nervous uh, the way they're doing it because I did it and I know what they're doing and what the holds are and if they're not just caught just exactly like I think they should be, then I get a little scared. and um, I just love it all. Um, I don't like a circus that drags its heels like uh, it's an act and then we stall and do something until the other show or the other act starts. I, I want it to move. Um, even if it's a lousy act, I don't care. Get it in there. Let's go. Keep it moving. Keep that audience entertained. That's what we're here for. Uh, so if you could be go back and change anything, be anything outside of working in the circus, what, what do you think you would have been, would have done? <laughs> 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 uh, 
Well, I truly wanted to be a beautician when I was a teenager and growing up. My aunt and uncle were going to pay my tuition and everything. Uh, and then I, for a long time, I thought, boy, I wish I'd have become a lawyer. But uh, as I've investigated, uh, it's pretty hard work. <laughs> so I don't know how well, a, and I'm a softy, so I'm not sure how good a lawyer I would have been. So I'm probably better off not have done that. But uh, that's about the only other things I truly would ever wanted to aspire to. Uh, it's kind of hard to answer that when you grow up in the business, and that's really all you know. Uh, um, I did do a factory job once. I was in the basement, and I taped under the dashboard of your cars is a bunch of wires they call a harness, and I put the tape around them <laughs> for six weeks, because that's all the longer I could stand it. <laughs> Definitely. Too repetitious. Definitely not circus work. <laughs> no, too repetitious. <laughs> because no matter how many times you hit that stake or how many times you drive that stake, it's in a different place and you've hit it just a little different and it's on a different angle. <laughs> There's always something different. And maybe that's the allure to circus. There's always something new, something different happening. Um so-and-so had a flat tire on the way today here. Uh, uh, the floor fell out, fell out of the elephant truck coming over the jump. Uh, you know, there's always something. And like I said, and you meet so many wonderful people. Just, just fantastic. We've made so many friends through that. Uh, You've seen a lot of the circus. You've worked in with them. You own them. You've managed them. Yeah. You personally, where do you see the circus going within the next ten to twenty years? It's not looking good. Um, we. It's as you said a little while ago, and I don't think we had the tape rolling, but things keep changing and they come back to things that have happened before. Um, and that's the only chance I think the circus has. Um, we have so much competition today with the... We just thought there was competition when the TV started. But now it's TV, movies, uh, tapes, uh, telephones that you do. The kids are just texting on all the time. There's the iPods. There, there's something to keep entertainment going. Um, when I grew up, we pulled in town. Boy, everybody was out. Something was happening. And nowadays. You can pull in town, you can uh, have a parade, and uh, the parade, even our little parades here in Hugo. My era, the whole town would have been there. You couldn't, the, I'm sure these streets were packed. Today, there's a few people lined up watching the parade because we have so much other things to do that seem to be more important. So I think that the show business, the circus, it's going to be a little hard for them to keep going. We've seen it dwindle, and years ago people said, oh, it's dying out, it's dying out. And I used to say, no, it'll never die out. Um, but I think it's going to get harder. Mm -hmm. may not completely ever go away, but it's just going to be harder and harder. That's my thinking. I'm hoping not. <laughs> Big time hoping not. Well, talk to me a little bit about the Showman's Club. How it started here in Hugo? Oh, Dum Dum here got it started. And, and what year was that? Two years ago. Okay. Let's see, this is 12, 11, 10, 9. 2009, in the fall of the year, we were 
blabbing about something and Maura actually I think is the one that says I am so sick of going to funerals and that's the only time we see anybody and um, I believe the museum or the chamber or the library had a little luncheon up here at Angie's and the, invited so many show people and we went up and we kind of talked but you couldn't talk because you're in the restaurant and you're not wanting to up interfere with other people, but and you couldn't hear what so and so was saying down there and this and that. And I guess I went home and was a little frustrated. Mm -hmm. Not that I ever get that way. And I said, "Well, this is malarkey. We're going to do something about it," meaning me. So I got on the horn and I checked with the VFW if I could use the hall and called everybody and told them we're going to get together and we're going to have a club or a social club or a whatever and uh, wound up with seems like around 36 people attended that night and I told them we could become a club like you know the other showman's club or we could just have get-togethers uh, you know, once a month or something where we could see everybody and visit. And we go for weeks on end. I don't see Lucy. I don't see this one. I don't see that one. And it's frustrating because they're our friends. We used to be together every day and see each other every day. And uh, so they all wanted to make it a club. And I, and I said... Even if we're a social club, we have to have some kind of leadership, you know. And so we became a club. We worked towards getting it all together, and here we are. <laughs> and we haven't been able to do a whole lot yet. Um, we uh, uh, Last year, we donated money to the Men United here in town, uh, we this year we donated to the VFW because they don't charge us even for using the hall out there and we're kind of embarrassed we do take up a little dollar collection and give them for electric but it's not enough to cover the electric even we use um, what else have we helped different little things very little things but we haven't had a lot of money until this year and I don't consider it a lot of money yet, but um, we've had the haunted house to raise money, and we've used the new museum that they're going to tear down, and we've paid, like last year, we paid their um, rent, I think it was, and then this year uh, we had to pay insurance to have it. Um, so in a sense, we've tried to help them, and we try to help them, you, we want, we're here to help. We haven't had a lot of people realize we're here and to ask. We had one lady came that she helps a lot of the teenagers. She's a great gal, works her tail off, and talked to us about doing some stuff, but we haven't heard any more from her. So, and we're just got new officers. Just January is our re-election, and... Now everybody's got to sign up and pay their dues, and um, I don't know what all we'll do this year. Terry's our president, and she's got umpteen zillion ideas she's inundating me with. <laughs> okay, Terry. Okay, Terry. Okay, Terry. Well, it's good. Which is good. Yeah, I mean, that's you great. To, you get to see each other every month. Right, right. And now, well, see, we've tried to, I don't, my problem, I'm not quite getting it somehow, and I don't know how to go about it, is we'll have our meeting, we eat, and then my thoughts were, then we'd sit around and BS, play games, do something. Well, we have a meeting, and we eat, and everybody leaves. <laughs> but the last several months, myself, Dixie, and Gus, and Billy... We sit and play penny ante poker and have a blast, the four of us. We laugh and carry on <laughs> at Goofy, and everybody was just there in that big old <laughs> VFW hall, but we have fun. 
and we try to talk them into staying. We want to get games. If they don't want to do that, do something else. If they don't want to do that, just sit around and make fun of us doing it. <laughs> you know, whatever. So we're together. But, uh, and we're going to do scholarships. We have four, I think it's four, maybe five, graduating this year. So we're going to help with scholarships this year for them. Uh, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, and I, I know a lot of them are anxious, and I said, but we're still a young club, guys. We, we've got to kind of still tread a little lightly and um, help what we can and when we can, And but it'll go. It'll keep, we're going to keep going until it just dies out. <laughs> well, what, what's special about Hugo that that keeps showmen here? I don't think there's anything special. It's just because there's been so many shows here that uh, other circus people are established here and live here that it attracts more people. Mm -hmm. We are... Um, A special family, a special breed of people. We have our own special language. It's, um, I can visit with you all with no problem. Most any of us can, but you're not show people, and there's a difference, and it's hard to explain. I don't like you or dislike you any more or any less than I do any show people. It's just we don't talk the same language. And I don't know how uh -oh. to explain it better than that. <laughs> BK is mom. And I don't know where that comes from. I will stay, say that on these circuses, carnival shows, wherever I have been. And I have accused my son of putting working men up to it. But he swears he doesn't. And just out of nowhere, they're calling me mom. I have more kids than the law allows. <laughs> they could be either really good or really bad. I think it's pretty good. <laughs> I like the most of them. And the ones I didn't like, I straightened them out, and then I liked them. <laughs> well, mom is better than grandma. Yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> Well, is there, is there anything else you'd like to share before we end? Anything we missed? We've, we've covered much so much. More. I know, I know. Um, Would you do it all over again? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Some parts I'd like to already know what I know now <laughs> and not screw up back the road, you know. But uh, I wouldn't change none of it. Not a thing. Not a thing. It's the most wonderful life there ever can be. Every child, every person in this country should have to spend one season on a circus and they would respect, honor more about life than anywhere else will ever teach them. And I can attest that that's true because I've had several of them do it. Mm. Nieces, nephews. <gasps> There's no electric MBK. How am I going to curl my hair? Oh, the hair dryer won't work. Boy, they appreciate that generator. They can stand out behind and get their hair dry. And But they learn that it's not all roses in this life. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's really true. Uh, kids grow up much better, much more prepared for life, I think, than a lot of just the kids that don't get a chance to do anything like that. It's been a good life. Very good. I think that's a good way to end. Better than most anybody could ever imagine. <laughs> I've done more things in my life than most people ever even dream about doing. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for, for sharing your life with us. We really appreciate it. Well, you gals are who we appreciate, every one of us, for doing this. And we just pray we don't embarrass you. <laughs> <laughs>